All right, you ready, Jay? Let's go. Let's go. You're listening to The Success Paradigm with your hosts, Jay Atkins and Greg Gray. And Greg, I am super, super excited about our next guest. It's got me all emotional. Um, <laughs> Is it silly that I really like that intro music? I mean, I, I, I just feel kind of silly about just excited, silly all the way around today, especially with the smiling face that we have joining us. I know. I'm so excited to introduce um, our next guest, Laura Harris. Um, this, you know, I'm so honored to have her on this podcast because she, um, she is. I think probably the number one person responsible for making other people successful authentically. And, um, you know, I know this personally because uh, Laura Harris, I get a little emotional when I think about this. Laura Harris swooped me up uh, very, very young in my career and saw something in me uh, that I didn't even see. And she, uh, she put me on my first stage. She gave me all the constructive criticism that one could desire. And um, she put me in front of some very influential people, some big people that made me think bigger. Um, and I'm just so thankful for that, Laura. And, and I think you are just an amazing human being that cares so much about other people. And um, you've impacted so many lives. So I think, you know, doing a podcast about the success paradigm, the fact that that is so important to you, have success and create success in others. That's why we wanted to have you on here first. So Laura, I want to personally thank you uh, for getting me to this point in my life and, and believing in me when I didn't believe in myself. Appreciate you guys. I thank the world of both of you. Well, so I, I, um, I'm looking so forward to interviewing you because I, I want to ask you some questions that I've never asked you before um, because I've always been selfish in asking you questions about how I could get better because I appreciated your opinion so much. So um, I think a lot of people out there um, want to know the story, the Laura Harris's glory. So I want to know where it all started for you and, and what made you you and what made you want to impact others' lives so much. Yeah, it was not glorious in the beginning. As a matter of fact, I, I was very, very blessed to be raised by two parents who were um, very honorable, had tremendous morals, um, cared about other people. I would say for both of them, it was very, they were polar opposites, but my parents both had the same, um, the characteristic that was my favorite in both of them was the fact that they had very high standards for themselves. So both my dad, who was in the banking industry, and my mom, who happened to be in as a, uh, work as an independent agent, both of them had insanely high standards for what they did at work. My mother was known as the encyclopedia. Uh, she gave me my first job and used to scream at me across the room because I was too loud on the phone all the time, and she'd tell me, you're too loud again. <laughs> but I was raised in a situation where I knew I was loved. And I think, obviously, that's a huge blessing. Um, but I, I think it's important to tell the rest of the story. First of all, I was a complete and utter dork. I was very introverted. I was never, ever on the front of anything that would have been considered, um, you know, a, a fad or anything. I wanted to not be seen. Um, and then in my dorky athletic um, personality, even in junior high and high school, I was wearing cleats to school because I played softball and I, co I love competing. Not, not necessarily to beat someone else, but I think just having this mentality of constantly trying to hone your skill, hone your skill, hone your skill, make yourself better, that came naturally from the time I was 13 years old because my dad and I used to play burnout. I was a 13-year-old girl, and my dad would throw the baseball as hard as he could throw the baseball, and I would my badge of honor, and I still have the glove from – and my dad's past years and years ago, but I still have my dad's glove because I would get so excited whenever I would have blood vessels in my hand that were broken. Wow. Because to me, that was a badge of honor that my dad really felt like I could handle the rough stuff. And guys, it is not always easy 
Um, I did not fit in in a lot of ways growing up. At, academics were easy for me. Studying was easy for me. Reading was easy for me. I still love to read, love it, love it. Um, so that is a huge key to success because, boy, if you're not constantly learning, you're not growing. There's just no question about it. But I think that what my parents instilled in me was this desire to always be better, always be better, always be better. And if it was the silly flag team when I was in ninth grade, I would spend three hours every day in my yard practicing with that flag. Because if I was going to be in front of someone, I was going to be the absolute best version of me that I could possibly create. And a lot of it came, truth be told, a lot of it came from insecurity and feeling like I had to measure up. So there was something in seeing them as so honorable and so respected that made me feel like in some ways, sadly, it gave me some insecurities because I felt like, okay, what if that's not good enough? What if, what if, what if, what if? So I was, I was very, very blessed to be a, ra a raised in a house where um, I saw those strong morals and those strong core values um, and then the rest of the story wasn't quite so pretty, but the beginning was awesome. <laughs> well, uh, because we like to ask about the part that's not so pretty. <laughs> because, oh, absolutely. Uh, there's, you know, part of what we want to always get at is, you know, the, the whole glory and story thing that they let off it. Everybody wants the story, the glory, but most people don't want or even know the story. So uh, there was some... Uh, I'm guessing this is going to be the case for everyone, but I want to know for you that part um, after awesome where it, it got a little more difficult or I'm not sure how you would characterize it wasn't awesome, though. I could Very tell dicey. by the way you said it. So talk about that. What was what are some of the Absolutely. moments that were that kind of helped form who you are? Yeah, I can start with the end in mind. I'm on marriage number three. Okay. So if that doesn't tell you, there was some hills and valleys. Um, full disclosure, I was at, at one point in time in a very abusive relationship for years that alienated me from friends and family. Um, I There were days, one in particular, where I thought, okay, this is it. This is the day I'm going to die. And so one of the things that that has done in my life is having been through that type of hardship I'm a firm believer. I love, love, love Purple Door, which is the women's shelter in Corpus Christi, Texas, because um, I was actually on the board for quite a while. And one of the things that I realized when I went on a tour through there is I was walking down a hall and there was someone who was staying in the women's shelter that was coming the other direction. And as soon as she saw me coming, her eyes went down. Hmm. And the instant she did that, it triggered me to back to the day where that was me, where I couldn't look people in the eye, where I was afraid of what was going to happen, where I didn't feel like I had control over the circumstances around me. And then what that does, Craig, is it creates a control freak who tries to control. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? If you're in a situation where you feel like in, in years worth of not being in control and, and knowing that things are broken, but truly, and for those of you that have been in an abusive situation, I get it. Like people say, why didn't you just get out? If you've been in it, you understand. It's not that simple. It, it, you don't just wake up and go, oh, well, that's dumb. I'm just not going to do that anymore. It's everything is gradual. And unfortunately, over a period of time, you you feel like you don't have options. Mm -hmm. And so, boy, trying to allow people into your life, which is difficult in a situation like that. But I went from being, you know, the crazy kid who wore the cleats to being very successful in school to many years, not not one or two, many years of of insecurity and you know still getting up and functioning during the day. And I think the best way to describe it is putting on the mask because they didn't want people to know how messed up things were behind the scenes. And not just that relationship, but me as a whole, because I lost my identity in all of that. And when you lose your identity, it's very difficult to move forward in an authentic way. You can make things happen, but it's exhausting when you lose your identity. So wow. would, you, would you say that's probably one of the reasons you want to help so many people and bring the best out of them? I, I, if I had to use two words to describe myself, um, besides being a, an insecure overachiever, I would say I'm a professional connector because it is very important to me for no gain of my own 
but to figure out, okay, if Greg knows this person, then it's really going to benefit both of them. So finding situations where there's that mutual synergy and 99% of the time, God doesn't have me in it. He just has me connect and get out of the way, uh, which is even better because then there's nothing in it for me. But that to me is where I get my high now because you can only succeed so much in business and, and um, have that really be something that energizes you. Um, once you get to the point to where that is all working, for me now today, it's about making sure that the people inside of my operation are insanely successful. Like I want them to walk away one story just briefly several years ago I had someone working for me that was going through a really ugly divorce and her and her husband took her children and would not bring them back at the end of the visitation and I she was not in a place where she was capable of handling it and I pulled her into my office and I said five years from now how you handle this one situation is going to have changed the trajectory of your life and I said we will get on the phone right now with an attorney we will have him served with papers before the end of the day tomorrow, and your kids will be back in your home tomorrow night because you cannot, you know, so just being that champion for people um, when they're in that moment that I've personally experienced where they're not capable of doing the next right thing themselves, but figuring out like, okay, like what is it that needs to be done in order for them to move forward and for them to become a better person? Well. I tell you, I'm really intrigued by that because the, the the concept of you being professional connector. So I've been in the same space with you dozens of times, and I've literally seen you do this like over and over again over the course of the day. You actually grab people's hands and take them over to this place or take them over to that place. Um, and it's pretty remarkable because everyone trust you. I, you know, I joked with you once, I think in a very large setting about the fact that no one wants to cross you because they know that you will tell them the truth, but you also, that's the authenticity that you were speaking of. So when did this, this professional connecting thing kind of go into overdrive for you? I mean, was that always who you were? Or did oh, something happen? No, no. It, it and it, it's funny because, um, when I first opened my business, I was a 33 year old kid. I did not know what I was doing. I had six credit cards. I had no money. I hired two people that didn't know anything about the business that we were going to be in. And I was terrified. I couldn't sleep at night. I would wake up every morning. And back then it was like pieces of paper. I would write down on the piece of paper. I am lying on the beaches of San Juan with my honor ring on. Cause I was trying to figure out like, what do I have to do to be successful just today, just today, just today. And, and, in the first three to five years of my life, because there were people who didn't believe in me, all I could do was take care of me. Like that was a full-time job. That and trying to be a functional human for my family was was all I could handle. And so as silly as it sounds, I, both, both of you guys know this story. Whenever I first was um, in this career, I was told by multiple people, you're never going to make it. No one's ever going to buy anything from you. You need to quit now. I, I was also told that in my personal life. If people knew the real you, nobody would like you. Wow. Wow. And you start believing that. But what happened over a period of time is I stopped eventually. I stopped getting my um, identity from the success of the business because, oh my goodness, you know, in 2000, 2001, there was a horrible mold scandal. We lost thousands of clients. We spent days with people screaming at us all day long. Uh, in 2007, it was hurricane problems. In, you know, I mean, the, the economy in 2008, there's just been crisis after crisis after crisis. And what I've learned is you can't waste the crisis. Mm -hmm. And what happened after a couple of years is I stopped focusing on me. And the minute I stopped focusing on me, the rest comes and falls into place. Because if you help enough, it, Zig Ziglar is famous for this. If you help enough people get what they need, then th the rest will come back to you. And you all probably know the exact way to say it. But it's like if, if you're becoming that person that cares more about the success of others, and a huge chunk of what matters to me today is that every single person inside my operation is making more money year after year after year. But it's got to come from them growing as a person and being more effective in this job. It can't just come because you, my, my job doesn't pay more for tenure. Hanging around does not make you more money. So I, 
I have become a person who understands if you stop focusing on yourself, then that insecurity and identity thing becomes less of an issue. And while you're focusing on other people, and both of you guys know, because within the last week, I've asked you to help someone that you did so graciously behind the scenes and made a difference in that person's life and that person's business succeeding. And, and Greg, I remember many years ago, whenever I was in, involved with an organization that didn't have a dime, and you offered on your own nickel to fly to a conference that they were holding, they couldn't pay for your hotel, for your flights, or Lord, even dream of a speaker's fee. And you came on your own nickel because you knew it was the right thing to do. And that's the mentality of this, this natural generosity. And as long as you live like that, um, and, and Jay, I remember the first time I saw you, you know that, you know, I remember the moment I saw you the very first time and you're right. I could see something different in you from the moment we met. And then once I got to talking to you, you really challenged my brain. And so I think another one of the keys to being tremendously successful is finding people like the two of you that are willing to be your mentors, who are willing to tell you the ugly, honest truth, which, you know, sometimes I don't like it, Greg, but that's okay. I always want it. I just have to digest it. I have to digest it. So, but part of that is me being triggered back to those days where somebody says, you're not going to make it. Nobody would like you if they knew you, those things. And so I have to digest it and think, okay, I know Greg loves me or I know Jay loves me. And you know what I mean? So um, we are all a mess underneath guys. There isn't one person out there who hasn't been a mess. And probably today I stood in Walmart a week ago in the line to check out and I was crying. Wow. And there wasn't anything bad going on. I was just overwhelmed with what we're dealing with in the current crisis and overwhelmed with knowing people that are really, really struggling through this. And, you know, it's so okay to not be okay. That transparency is, is huge in what makes you successful because people can spot a phony a mile away. So, uh, Laura, you know, one of the things that you taught me from the very beginning is to have men. Um, is something that um, I, I've adopted several. Um, everything in my business I stole from you and I stole from other agents. Most of it was from you, um, but I stole from a lot of other agents. But who who was your favorite mentor? Well, I, I would say, and this is a little bit of a selfish thing, um, without a doubt, it's Lori Clements. And you guys have both met Lori. Lori is a, is a personal coach for Entrepreneurial Operating System. And Lori Clements changed my personal life as much as she changed my professional life. Um, Lori is someone who, even throughout this coronavirus, has reached out to me and said, listen, do you just need to talk? Is there anything I can do for you? Finding people that not only challenge my brain, because I hate to say it, just being brutally honest, my respect level is attached to someone ho holding themselves to high standards and constantly learning and wanting to improve themselves. Uh, Lori is someone who has run so many companies, I can't even count in so many countries and speaks all these crazy languages, but she challenges me in a way that I'm not used to. And um, so that, that has been a huge thing, but I've also been really blessed with prior employers. I mean, I, I worked for a man at State Farm, Tom Hunt, who absolutely was life-changing for me. That man trusted me with his business. He was crazy and nuts because this was when I was 29 or 30 years old. And he really let me run that operation. And I learned, I made so many mistakes and he was so gracious with me making mistakes. And a good mentor will put you out of your comfort zone and force you to make mistakes and get you to do things that you're just like, uh, -uh I can't, nope, yeah, nope. And Tom and Lori have both pushed me to that point. And so I would say you don't really have a mentor if you don't have somebody that has said something that has offended you. Because mm. people who truly love you on occasion will be brutally honest. And my mother tells me sometimes I'm a little too brutally honest. But I, I think that the, the challenge is, and I, I keep these little rocks in front of me all the time. One of the rocks says coachable. And these are our core values. And actually, these rocks are from Lori. And the coachable one says, you have to give me permission to coach you. Yeah, exactly. So we've got our rocks because it's like, I'm going to focus on what our core values are. And one of the big ones is being coachable. But whether it's somebody that's in my personal life or somebody that's in my business or a, a peer that, you know, business owner that I know, you have to give me permission. 
And Jay, you have been probably more than anyone I know, really good about saying, how could I be better? What could I do different? How do I make, you know what I'm saying? Like, you have to give me permission to speak into your life. Now, sometimes it'll freak people out. My friend Amy, I, I told her one time at the coffee shop, I said, I know I'm not the person I should be, and I know you know what I need to do next. And I am not going to say another word until you tell me what it is. Because I knew she was trying to be sweet, and I'm like, no, no. You know what I mean? And so sometimes you really have to push somebody and say, listen, if you need me to come back tomorrow, and that gives you time to think about how you're going to position it, that's fine. But I want the rough stuff because I don't get better without the rough stuff. If I'm not willing to be challenged, if I'm not willing to, to have my feelings hurt because I'm not perfect, anyone who knows me, including both of you, knows that. But it's like, it's okay. When I'm out of bounds, please tell me. Try to be polite because you're triggering crazy, but that's okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think it's important to, to put yourself in a place where you're willing to be mentored. But then the other half of that is you always have a responsibility to mentor someone. You Anyone and everyone that's listening to this knows someone that they could help. And it doesn't have to be monetarily. It doesn't have to be you're a professional coach. But you know someone that you can help in some way. And I wake up in the morning and I write in my journal, God, give me an opportunity to help someone today. If you ask him, he'll do it. Like, And sometimes it's little bitty things. But sometimes it's things that seem very little to me. And it turns out to be something that actually had a much more dramatic impact on someone else. So I think, you know, being a mentor and asking people to mentor you is just this constant. Well, I will tell you, my most favorite thing about you is I know I'm always going to get honest feedback. And you and Greg have taught me the most, especially from stage. Because um, when I get off stage, you're the first person I come and say, what could I have done different? What could I have done better? And you always, always have something. And I, I'm, I'm honestly waiting for the day that I can walk away from you and like, do this little like pump, pump. You can't do it. Um, I, I'll get there. I'm going to get there. But I love that uh, you always have something for me to work on. And you know that's what I'm asking. For. You know that's what I want. So I Can I it. tell you about the stage time? Yeah. In 1996, I was asked to speak professionally for the first time, and I refused. Hmm. Absolutely refused. And I was so insecure in that moment. I was probably 35 or so. I was so insecure that you couldn't, I mean, there was no amount of money. There was no amount of bribery. There was no amount of anything that it would have gotten me to do it. And, and finally, the people that, that were asking me to do this said, listen, can we just sit at a table with just a couple of people and just share what you're doing to be so successful in your business? And I'm like, fine, but it, I will not stand up and talk in front of people. I'm not a speaker. I'm not a teacher. I'm not a coach. I, I, but if a couple of people want to sit around and we drink coffee and we're all sitting at a table as equals, I can do it. It took me two months to prepare for that because I was so overwhelmed and so insecure. And I finally did it. And then they asked me, OK, there's this one other group. Can you do it with them? And I'm like, OK, but it has to be seated. It has to be at a table. I'm not teaching. I'm not doing. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. And this went on, guys. And, and each time it was just a few more people. Mm. And just a little bit more. And, and I will never forget the first time I really stood up in front of people and spoke, which was in Baton Rouge, this this little kid who who raised his hand and he goes, and this was after probably 15 minutes, and he raised his hand and I thought, oh, good, somebody has a question. I'll feel better if somebody has a question, you know, instead of me trying to remember my download that I had practiced and practiced and practiced. And he raised his hand and he goes, honey, could you just take a breath? You're making me a nervous wreck. <laughs> and standing on stage represented being judged. Oh, boy. And yes. keep in mind, if people really knew you, no one would like you. Mm. And so for me, it was horrible. It was horrifying to stand up on stage. But backing down to my mentality, three hours in the yard will get you on the flag team every day, three hours in the yard. So what I did was I spent the next 10 years, Jay, in Toastmasters asking people to criticize my speaking abilities. I did not know that. And after 10 years of I read every book. Oh, my goodness. There's an amazing book out there if there's anybody, and both of you guys don't need this, but uh, if there's anybody out there that doesn't like speaking in public, uh, Roger Ailes wrote a book called You Are the Message, which is fantastic because he talks about people just want to know you. 
Like they don't need a polished speaker. They don't need a professional whatever. They just want you to speak from your heart and just share you. And that book instantly changed my life because I was somehow able to stay in the moment from that moment forward without thinking about what are they thinking and what are, you know, all the what ifs and, you know, all the critics and people that hate me or whatever else I was going on in my brain. I used to spend three days throwing up before I would go speak. And I'm not exaggerating. I was physically ill for days before I had to speak. And now it is where I feel the most authentic. Well, that, by the way, I think there's probably that 90% of the people that are listening to this and watching this will relate to that, Laura, because that is the ultimate judgment zone in our head to be, especially on an elevated stage with a bunch of people, some of whom pay to be in the space to look at you. Um, so there's a couple of things that you shared in there that I just, that are bouncing around in my head. And I just want to say them out loud because I don't want anybody to miss them. Uh, one of them was around mentoring and the fact that you do it without an expectation of reciprocation or reciprocity, that you do it because it's a good thing to do. And, it, and if no one does anything back for you, I, I, I say that because there are a lot of people well-intended that um, do to receive instead of just doing to do and uh, you can see through them like a pane of glass and sometimes they're not even aware of it they're not doing it maliciously but that's a huge takeaway as if um, it's it's kind of like doing random acts of kindness that no one will ever know that you did like I I don't know what they are Laura but there's probably 50 things you've done that have benefited me that I will never know and I can appreciate it without knowing what they are because I know who you are um, so, but your story about how you became, are, are becoming more comfortable. I don't think we ever get there. I think we're just getting there. Ties back to something else that I know about you that is one of your reputations. And this is going to be a wonderful thing. If, uh -oh. Don't grit your teeth. Don't grit your teeth. This is good stuff. You are known uh, far and wide by people who work uh, with you and have known you as the process queen. So... Uh, you were talking earlier about making a mistake, and in my head, I laughed. I was like, well, Laura, she's okay with making a mistake, but she ain't making it twice if she can get around it. So uh, I feel like, uh, and we joke about that. I hear people joke with you. It's like she has a blueprint for everything. Like she knows from beginning to how has that factored into you being able to be um, successful, and what is, what are the takeaways that you think people should um, what should they think about around having a blueprint or a plan and not just spitting in the wind, so to speak? Yeah, let me go back to how that happened. Okay. Uh, if you go back to the first two years that I owned my business, it was me and two people who didn't know anything about the business. And so I was training them as we were going. And um, sadly, I'm a control freak, particularly when you have no money. The fear kicks in and you think, OK, well, if I could answer the phone better than they're answering the phone, I'll answer the phone. And you know what I mean? So what I created in the first year was a situation where two things. First of all, I met a lady who had the exact same size office as me and she was selling three times as much. And one of the things that I have done is I have visited many successful businesses over the years. And what I found out was nobody told her how many policies she should be selling in a month. So she didn't know to stop when she got to a certain number. And once I met her, I went back to my operation and we immediately tripled our production because we no longer had blinders on that that's where we were supposed to stop. My mentor told me where to stop and I stopped there every month because I thought that was success and that was the best we could do. But the other thing that happened after a couple of years is I got to the place where I was constantly hearing <laughs> from the two people that worked for me, well, I was too busy today to sell anything. You know, the phones were really busy and I was servicing and it got really busy and everything was crazy and you know how things are and I just didn't have time. So mentally I came to a place where I understood sales was the last resort. Hmm. It wasn't proactive, it was reactive. So I realized inside my operation, I had to segment the sales and the service so that myself and one other person could be focused on sales all day long and the other person could be focused on service all day long. So the three of us had very clear accountability. I would start there. You've got to have very clear accountability. 
But then I was walking through, and I remember this like it was yesterday. This was many years ago, walking through the half price bookstore, practically in tears because I was so depressed about how bad the operation was doing. And I was walking and I saw this book and it said E Myth. And I'm like, how dumb is that author? Nobody even knows what E Myth is. Who's going to buy a book when they don't even know what E Myth is? That's got to be the dumbest author in the whole wide world. And so I picked up the book. Well, now I look back and I think, if it had said, something very clear that I had understood, I wouldn't have even picked it up. But it was the fact that I didn't understand it that made me pick up that book. And when I read the back of that book, the cover talked about my life. It was my life. It was, are you as an entrepreneur overwhelmed because you're so busy in the business? I mean, it was my life. It was, I was standing now in Half Price Bookstore crying because I'm like, he gets me, he gets me. I mean, there's hundreds of thousands of books. And that blue book changed my life. So with that book, I start understanding the importance of having processes in place. The challenge is I still created a business that revolved around me. Hmm. Which is hard. So the first say. time I went on a trip, right. I did not have any fun because the entire time I was gone, I was sitting here thinking, oh, my gosh, I forgot to tell them what happens if that yellow button pops up on the screen. They don't have to do any because I had everything revolving around me. And as long as I was in it, it was great. So uh, both of you guys know I eventually wrote a book, Surrender to Win. This is what you don't know. For five years, I worked on that book and didn't finish it. And you've both written multiple books. But for five years, I had people saying, well, don't you have all this stuff you talk about on stage? Don't you have it in writing so that you can share it with us? And I'm like, no, 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 because my insecurities wouldn't allow me to write. Because then I thought, well, people will judge me. They'll think, oh, she thinks she's all that in a bag of chips. So right. I didn't want to write, but right before my dad died, I realized I had spent all this time writing the book, and I was afraid to finish it for fear of what people would think about me. And in that moment, it finally occurred to me, I cared more about what my dad thought wow. when he saw the pub book published than anything else in the whole wide world. And I thought, I don't care if everybody in the whole world judges me. Before my dad dies, because he was sick for many years in a wheelchair and dying. Before my dad dies, I want my dad to see the book. And so figure out what your motivation has to be to finish that thing you started many years ago and you didn't have the nerve to finish, whether it was because of insecurities or time. We have lots of time now, guys. Um, figure out what that thing is. Figure out what that motivation is. And so I wrote Surrender to Win to fix my broken office. And then I backed that up with processes. Exactly how do we do each thing inside of our operation? So there's a list of which jobs, every job is owned by one person and one person only. Okay, that's our job accountability sheet. So that there's no question who owns every process because how many people can get in trouble if it doesn't get done? One. One. That's so it. guess what? It gets done. Because everybody knows who's going to get in trouble if that job doesn't get done. So as long as there's clear accountability, but then we created an operations manual. And an operations manual says this is exactly how you do that job. So we sat down together as a team and figured out exactly what that needs to look like so that there was no question about how to do it and exactly what the expectations were. And so when a new person comes on, I educate them with that operations manual. So that process thing originally started from me being such a mess. But now what it's done is it's so radically relieved stress because everyone knows exactly what the expectations are. You don't have to wonder if you're going to get screamed at if you only called on Tuesday and Thursday instead of five days a week. You know what the expectations are. So processes, I, this is crazy because years ago, one of my favorite mentors, Michelle Lee, um, had hired me to come speak in, in Seattle, Washington. And somebody called me and they said, she says that you're a micromanager. And, and, you know, for somebody to call me and say, well, you're a micromanager. And I thought, I think that's offensive. I don't think that's a good thing. <laughs> and then finally, it occurred to me, I micromanage processes so that I never have to micromanage people. There you go. And so all of the systems are designed so that I have the ability to take stress off the people that work with me. And I've given to everybody for free. So if you want anything, just email me, lauriharris at allstate.com, and I'll send you the operations manual or anything else I've got. But it's a, a way for someone to take the materials and try and execute it inside their own operation. Every day, at least once a day, I'm talking to an agent that I've never met before that I don't know from Adam that I've 
connected with on Facebook and help them figure out what's the next thing to do. But then I give them an assignment and you need to go do it. Um, totally free of charge, but being having those systems allows someone else to have, make an improvement easily. Great. So, Laura, I'm going to ask you to tell me what one success habit you could share with our listeners that if they committed to it, one that you do on a daily or weekly or monthly basis that you, could, you feel that could change their life, what habit could they incorporate right now today? Yeah, I mean, there's no question. Well, can I have two? Yep. First of all, I think you have to get up early. And second of all, I think you have to read. Because when you get up early, it allows you to position yourself and be in proactive mode, not in reactive mode. If, if I walk inside the office at five minutes till eight o'clock and I work from eight to five, I can promise you I'm reactive 100% of the time. Versus if I get to the office at least an hour before the phone can start ringing, by the time that phone is open where it can start ringing, I'm already proactively knowing what are the first 15 things I'm going to do. And so do I still have to have some of my day be reactive? Absolutely. But being there early allows me to organize and structure the chaos that I left at the end of the day, <laughs> the day before, because, I mean, there's always more than you can get done. And if not, then you're probably not doing enough. But um, I, I do think that getting up early and then and then reading and and I think reading a variety, you know what I mean? Don't just read business books. Don't just read. I love to read Christian books. Don't just I think challenging yourself to read something that, you know, kind of a little out of your wheelhouse is always good. And one of my favorite books, I've, and one of my stones is, is resilience. One of my favorite books, it sounds kind of crazy, is a book called Unoffendable. Because for people who have thin skin, and I have very thin skin, very thin skin. If you, uh, Kevin Melnarnik will tell you if he looks at my ideal traits test that I like scored a 16 out of 100 on uh, resilience. I'm not good at it. But that book talks about how you can position yourself mentally so that if somebody else is out of line, you can process it quicker and get back to that good place. My entire office has read that book because I felt like it was so crucial and, and just – um, full disclosure, it does have scriptural undertones in it, but it's not about that. It's about the fact that it teaches you how to get to the place of process. Well, you know, if they're being irrational, maybe it's because they lost their job. Maybe it's because they found out they had cancer. Maybe it's because, so instead of making it about you, you're able to reposition it so that it's not necessarily, I mean, they might just be a jerk. A couple of guys, I've told them, you've never been happy once in all the times you've ever called. What do you want now? And believe me, from that moment forward, it was over. My employees are not allowed to speak like that, by the way. But I've, I've done it maybe twice in 30, 26 years in business where I've had to back someone down who just is consistently a jerk. But after that, there's never a problem again. Um, but I do think that reading things that are just a little obscure is nice to stretch your brain. So if, if you're watching this, you see me writing a lot because I'm taking a lot of notes, Laura, and I've talked to you a lot. And, and you know, I, I do get up early. Um, just recently in the last two years, I was not an early bird, but I've never, I, I've, I've gotten up early for selfish reasons to have time to myself, but I've never really thought about getting up to be proactive. And that is so true. Um, you know, that you, I mean, the fact that you pointed out that if you get up to be proactive, I never thought about it that way, but I think it's going to help me get up earlier now to know that I'm not going to be reactive later. So that, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that and also reading reading is um you know improved my life and i think everyone listening if you're not doing those two things you need to change that tomorrow well i, I will tell you that, so one of the advantages that jay and i have in interviewing you laura is that we've known you for a while and so we've seen things that you do that a lot of people are unable to do and so i'm going to go somewhere because you know i like to go somewhere every once in a while uh, you have a very, um, I don't know if it's correct to call it skill set, but uh, or more a talent or a gift. You, you operate in lots of different circles that the people in those circles don't operate together. Like you are able to swim in this pool and swim in this pool, but the people who normally swim in those pools don't swim in each other's pools but you seem almost effortlessly 
to go from one place to the next. And that's difficult to do because usually people are trying to build their camps. You know, you got it want... backwards, buddy. It's oh. 10 times harder to swim in all the pools. <laughs> it's easy to pick. A, it's easy. And you yeah. know where I go to mentally? I mean, yeah. my parents had got divorced when I was 19. Neither one of my parents made me choose. Hmm. If you love him, you can't love me or vice versa. Never. But I've seen in so many situations where it's like, well, if you're his friend, you can't be my friend. And I'm like, right. okay, that's fine. But that's a choice you're making because I'm not making that choice. Right. And and um, I have had, oh, gosh, I mean, this is live. So there's people watching this that know that I am so far from perfect. And I've had many situations where one in particular where after a very long period of time, God told me I had to call and apologize to someone and I did not want to call and apologize. And it was an ugly battle. And it was just, I didn't have a choice. And I finally did. And let me tell you, three years later, uh, that person has become one of my best friends and is somebody who challenges me in a very unique way and mentors me. And, and what I've decided is there will always be people who are going to choose a side. And, and I hate, I'll just use politics as an example. I hate people who are like, well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? To me, it's like all the disunity is causing such dysfunction. And I can see good in every side. And I can tell you there is not one person on this earth that knows me one iota that couldn't see bad in me. So I think it's important to try and focus on the good in each of the parties involved and know that sometimes you got to have to back away from both of them in order for everybody to calm down because sometimes one person doesn't want you to be friends with the other person. And they have to get to a place mentally where they're going to be okay that you're going to be okay <laughs> with everybody. Yeah. You know, so I, it's, it is, uh, but I think it's absolutely 10 times harder than picking a side. Picking a side is easy, yeah. <laughs> you know, and just cutting people out of your life is easy. But what I've learned over the years is it's always way harder to fix it on the back end. Mm. You know what I mean? There's yeah. always a day when you're going to have to repair things. I hope for in, everyone who has that type of a situation and it's a whole, the longer you go, the harder it is to repair. So, you know, not, not always easy, but trying to see the good in every single person um, and knowing that, and I'll just use myself in as example, there were times in my life when people would not have described me as a good friend at all, mm. at all, because who I was in that moment was the person who didn't believe in herself, the person who believed if people knew what you were really like, no one would like you, the pe person who alienated people for fear of if they get too close to me, they might no, I'm a mess. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to give each other a lot of grace um, because I'm the least perfect one I know. Well, so I got to follow up on and because this is a question I've just been burning to ask you. Uh, I have three daughters. Yes. Uh, and they're, um, they're all grown up. They all get their mail at their own address. Hallelujah. That's one of the things parents look forward to. But, um, it, and success, you know, it does, it transcends all, but just to be real, uh, to be a successful whim, woman, especially in an environment that is predominantly male, uh, for really not just for the women that are listening, but for the men that are listening as well, what is it that, um, where what's the challenge that you think uh, was your greatest one and what is it that you want uh, young women like my daughters to understand not only that they're going to go through but that they can make it through uh, as they um, seek success absolutely yeah actually in a lot of ways i think it's easier for women okay than it is men um let me let me back up though i told you guys that my father was sick for many years before he passed um, there was one day in particular before he passed. Now, keep in mind, I had seen my dad as this successful person who worked at IBM and all of these crazy places, and he retired from three different companies. When the Y2K came in, they asked him to come out of retirement so that he could come in and teach the banks how to make sure that the whole world didn't explode in 2000. You know, my dad was so well-respected. But one of the things that I think is the most important thing, and it's such a perfect time, is... 
respecting my parents created me being a workaholic. Because what I admired most in them was their desire to be very successful and knowledgeable and respected in their careers. And um, there was a time when I, not proud of it all, when my oldest daughter was 17 years old, it was the week she turned, no, it was the week she turned 18. And she had asked me to do something and I told her no and I was exhausted. And at the time we did not have a good relationship because I was a workaholic. And I was at work one day and I just felt like I needed to go home, which was weird. I didn't even go home for lunch. I never went home and it was 10 o'clock in the morning and I'm like, I don't understand, but okay, whatever. So I went home. When I got to the house on a school day, her blue Mustang was backed up into the, into the garage and she was moving out. Hmm. It was three months before she graduated from high school and she don't have anything to do with me. And she walked out of the house with a handful of stuff as I was coming into the garage. And I knew instantly that my workaholic tendencies over all those years had created a lack of communication between us that was horribly damaged, horribly damaged. And in that moment, I said, Kristen, can we please just go sit down and talk? And she goes, now you have time for me. Now you want to talk. Hmm. Guys, I got nothing. We didn't speak for months. I sat in the room where she graduated, but I was not a part of her graduation, her senior year. And a few months after that, one of the girls who had worked for us, who was one of her best friends, died in a car wreck. And we rode three hours in a car together, holding hands and crying because we were finally in that place where we were ready to make amends and ready to make things okay. And when my dad died, guys, I saw him sitting in a chair one day. It was just he and I alone at the house and we were watching some silly baseball game. We don't even like baseball. We watch football, Dallas Cowboys, in case you're wondering, Dallas Cowboys, okay? I used to sit on the floor with my football and daddy would sit on his recliner and we'd watch Dallas Cowboys together. But when he was in his last few years, he was no longer verbal, but he was completely fine mentally. And he was sitting in his wheelchair one day and I was talking and talking because I never shut up, as you've quite well figured. Kind of hard to do a podcast when the speaker doesn't <laughs> shut up. But I'm sitting there and I'm watching TV and I'm talking about the game and I don't care anything about baseball, but I'm still talking and he can't talk. But I look over because I realize something's not right. And he is bawling. And I'd only seen my dad cry two times ever. One was when he was going through the divorce and one was that day. And I knew instantly that he was in that place where I had been when Kristen was moving out. And he was regretting all of the work that gave him identity for all of those years that made him feel respected, that was everything he wanted in life, that was his priority. And I immediately said, you were a good daddy. And he just kept shaking his head and, and just bawling. I mean, this is a 72 year old man and he's shaking his head and bawling. And I said, yes, you were. I said, do you remember when you played burnout with me in the backyard? I said, my hands would have bruises all over them. And I talked about him coming to all my games and how proud he was whenever I wrote my book. And even in hearing this, you understand, I was explaining to him all of the things that I felt like I had to do to get his love, including writing a book and being good at softball and being good at the flag team and getting straight A's and all of these things. And he cried and cried. And I try really hard to remember that a lot because I'm 60 this year. And 20, 30 years down the road, I'll be that person in that wheelchair. And I don't want to look back and feel like, man, I've just messed up. I'm blessed now. I have both my daughters working in my business. And Kristen's 18-year-old is now working in our business. She started a week ago. She sold six wow. policies in her first week. Awesome six policies in her first week with a license and the girl just turned 18 a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, it is so nice to be able to engage with them on a daily basis and to love on my grandkids. Now you could take this business away from me. I just couldn't care less because my grandkids tell me they're building me a guest house out in the backyard where I can live whenever I get old. But um, boy, making sure that, that you as the dad, are constantly teaching them what the right priorities are so that they don't get 
so focused on, I got to prove I can make it. Cause I remember that feeling. I got to prove as a girl, I knew I had to work twice as hard. I knew I had to. And when I started, it was definitely at least 80% men in the industry. So it was like, you know, no, I have to do twice as much, but it almost cost me my child. Mm. And if something had happened and she had passed instead, I would have never forgiven myself. I don't know how I would have lived. But I think as, as a, a female now, fighting to pull other people up is how you become more successful. So seeing your children help people like you help people is going to be where they get their real, you know, where that generosity is going to be where they get their um, identity from moving forward. Um, because you get outside of yourself. You guys have heard that many times now in the last hour. You, you, the sooner you get outside of yourself, the sooner you stop worrying about what people are thinking about you, the sooner you stop caring about like, what are they thinking when I'm on stage or doing this podcast or whatever and figuring out, okay, how can I just help one person today? That's all I need to do. So Laura, I, I have to say, um, I know you went through that with your daughter, but uh, when I saw your daughter on stage with you, at our last conference, you had to be one of the proudest mothers ever because um, I was so proud for you. Um, and I know that was just a moment of working with her and, and watching her flourish in front of your eyes and, and take a stage that you've been on for 20, 25 years. Um, you've done a phenomenal job with her. I have so much admiration for you and um, Crystal. She's an amazing human being. And she learned so much from you. So I know you worked a lot, but you were also an amazing example of um, how to create success in her life. And she was very fortunate to have you as a mother, even though you had that moment in time that you didn't do something right. You did so much right with her and watching her next to you was just amazing. We asked her, we invited her back um, because yeah. she did such a phenomenal job. And she was like a mini Laura Harris. It was, it was just awesome to watch um, what you produced. And You know, I got that from my mom because my mom always taught me and my siblings, I've got, there's two girls, two boys in my family. She always said, your family will be there when other people are gone. I mean, she focused on that. I can't, I heard that a thousand times. Your brothers and sisters will always be there for you no matter what. And so mom has been amazing at connecting the fact that you got to go back to focus on family. So yeah, and I'm, I'm proud. You Wait till you meet Care Bear. Care Bear's in the service department now. She, I've got both of my daughters working the agency now, so. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question, and then I think Greg's got one more, and then we're going to wrap this up. I'm going to recap um, all these nuggets that you uh, gave us on this podcast. So um, just a quick question. What are three books um, that you would recommend our listeners read in the next 90 days? Like commit to reading these books because we talked about how important it is, but what three books? You gave us some books already, E-Myth, Unoffendable, You Are the Message, but what books to like – kind of get them headed in the right direction or if they're going in the right direction to just kind of put that gap in their back. Yeah, I, I think um, I think the most important book right this minute is The Millionaire Next Door. Because that book radically changed my entire perspective on everything in the world. Um, it talks about the fact that the average millionaire, now this is not somebody who's achieved 1 million. This is people with hundreds of millions of dollars. The average millionaire that they, that they studied in that group had never paid more than $250, $268 on a watch or more than $400 on a suit. What that book taught me was you don't have to impress anybody. You don't need to drive a brand new Lincoln every single year. You don't need to have fancy clothes. You don't need to. And that book, and see, it's sadly, every book is, the book each person needs is different based on the problem. But for me, part of my mentality of creating this, I'm okay. And particularly, Greg, as a female, see, I've arrived. You know, I'm driving a nice new car. I've got this. I've got that. Was backing down to, wait a minute. I can have hundreds of thousands of dollars in a checking account and feel just good. I don't have to show anybody. <laughs> and that's what that book teaches you is that it's like, no, 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 no. It's not about proving you've arrived. You know, that, that book is phenomenal, but E-Myth is definitely one of the top ones. Unoffendable is probably made as much of a difference in my career as any other book. Um, I love good to great because good oh, yeah. to great, especially for business owners helps you realize anytime there's a challenge in your operation, you look in the mirror because odds are you created it. And I wouldn't say odds are, I would say you have created it. Um, but yeah, good to great, E-Myth, Unoffendable, um, and The Millionaire Next Door would definitely be my top five. 
we start that book next week in our book club next week. Yep. Cool. Absolutely. It's one of my, I've read it like six times and it's like I it's like the first time I'm not usually one that's ever given people books. That's a book that I've actually gifted to people probably a dozen times because it's just um it's just remarkable. I won't I won't get into that book because I'll I'll be talking about that for another hour. It's it's a game changer. So uh my last question for you, Laura. Um before I ask it, uh, thank you for being so transparent. And I I know that there are people that are watching this podcast and listening to it that have learned some things about you that they did not know before, which is exactly what we were trying to get at here, the, the story, not just the finish line. Um, so this is my question, uh, or actually it's kind of a fill in the blank kind of thing. So if you are going to, um, speak this sentence uh i know i will have been truly successful if blank what goes in that space for you i know i will be successful if i live generously and apologize quickly i pretty much have to apologize to someone at least once a day because either i communicated something not ideally, or I didn't catch a signal that they needed me, or whatever it is. But I do think that that living generously and and wake up every morning and ask God, just show me one person I can help today. And it doesn't have to be money. Sometimes it's time. Sometimes it's you know knowledge. Sometimes it's but finding a way to be generous, but also. The minute you realize that you've hurt someone or offended someone, even if it was completely unintentional, boy, apologize quick. Because hmm. cleaning that slate and for that person to understand, I, what I used to do was I used to feel like, well, they should know my heart. They know I'm not meaning for that to be ugly. No. Don't assume that they know your heart. Don't assume that, no. If, if it doesn't matter if I didn't mean it the way they took it, if they took it in a way that was offensive, then I need to, number one, apologize. And then number two, give them an opportunity to communicate so that we can get on a level playing field. Because if I allow any situation where I have intentionally got discourse with someone, that will be my stumbling block moving forward. Wow, that was quick. <laughs> uh, successful people have the right answers. Thank and you. don't forget more books. Anything Gino Wickman ever wrote. <laughs> okay. Entrepreneurial operating system is a game changer for business. I mean, anything, traction, uh, rocket fuel, um, any of those books that Gino Wickman wrote are phenomenal. So, Laura, you are definitely a legend. Um, anybody listening to this will agree with me. And I think it's also true that you've already um, left a great legacy. Um, and I think that's what success is all about, is leaving a great legacy. Um, and I think um, this podcast has been awesome. I'm not sure how we're going to top it. Um, you were amazing to talk to. I love how transparent you are. I learned a lot more about you today, uh, which was why I was most excited about this podcast. But I'm going to recap all the nuggets um, that I think are ingredients for Laura Harris's success and legacy. And that is um, having high standards that you love to compete, you know it's not always easy, you also embrace that. Um, you read constantly, you're always getting better even today, tomorrow, and beyond. You also teach that. Um, always be the best version of yourself every single day. Get up early, read every day. And the three books I wanna remind everyone, The Millionaire, Mind, the millionaire Next Door, The Myth, and The Great. Laura, it has been such, such, such a pleasure. Uh, and I'm so glad that you, I know you're super busy and you got a lot of things going on. I'm just glad that you volunteered to do this with us. And um, I, I just appreciate um, everything you've done for me in my life and um, for my business and for my family and just being the example that um, I think everyone needs in their life. Yep. Thank you for reminding us. I appreciate us you guys. Thank you for reminding us that success is about significance. Amen. That's Laura Harris, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. I appreciate it, guys. Make it a good day. Now go do something. <laughs> I will do.